research in recent years uh, has taught us more about the effects of stress on the brain. And there's no doubt that manageable stress brings biological changes which improve our endurance, awareness, strengths, determination, and even immunity, the immune system, following moderate uh, levels of stress. And transient stress, particularly, if it doesn't go on too long, um, seems to respond uh, in a very positive and life-promoting way. Extreme stress releases the same chemicals in increased amounts, inhibiting certain memory functions, uh, as we shall see in a minute. And indeed, catastrophic mental experiences change the whole functioning and indeed the structure of the brain, emphasizing its plastic nature. It's only in recent years that we've become aware that brain cells can die and be replaced even in quite late adult life. It was assumed at one time that, you know, if you had a brain cell, it was there for life. If you hadn't got it, if you lost it, it would never be replaced. But if that, that's not strictly true. And uh, the brain is a much more plastic organ, organ than people had realized. In the normal response to stress, uh, glucocorticoids are released, which regulate the release of the catecholamines, adrenaline, and also, corticotrophin releasing factor as an intermediary in the, in the uh, pituitary. But the main function of this whole thing is to provide energy in the form of glucose and indeed to boost immune function. It takes us a bit further than the kind of picture of the reaction to stress that I was brought up with many, many years ago. And it was adrenaline and sympathetic nervous system as being the main issue that we needed to learn about. Oxytocin, interestingly, inhibits memory consolidation. And again, I'm going to say a bit more about that in a minute. And vasopressin, the antidiuretic hormone, prevents rehydration. So we know a great deal more about normal responses to stress than we used to, including these wonderful things, the endogenous opioids which control pain and depression. You know, someone can actually break a limb while playing in a rugby game and carry on playing. You don't actually begin to feel the pain until afterwards. Problems arising following trauma, fear, anxiety, and panic, I'll say more about PTSD, dissociative disorders. Looking first of all at the fear bit. Um, one of the problems for us today is that we're unfamiliar with the physical effects of fear. Most of us have experienced it to some extent when we've had an important exam or we've been um, having to have an interview for a job and our mouth's gone dry and we've built up physiological symptoms, but they're soon over and we then forget about it. But uh, following a bereavement, you remain anxious the world has become a dangerous place. Suddenly, all those symptoms of fear tend to feed on themselves. The woman lies in bed with her heart thumping in her chest. She thinks, my God, am I having a heart attack? My husband died of a heart attack. And immediately, her heart th thumps faster, and that perpetuates the fear. So the danger provokes the symptoms, and the symptoms then become part of the danger, and you get a vicious spiral of fear and symptoms feeding on itself. You're all familiar with these symptoms, which I'll show rather rapidly. The arousal, hyper-alertness, difficulty in sleeping. Any symptom aggravated, pain or almost much worse when you're tuned in and hyper-alert. Tension, tremor, palpitations, chest pains, sweating, dry mouth, bowel and bladder upset. All of those things which are normal physiological reactions to situation and danger, which in the environment of, of evolution would have, would have ensured our survival. But to people in the world today are seen as abnormal, as symptoms to be worried about, and things that will feed on themselves. So it follows that the more we can help people to prepare for these events before they happen, warning people perhaps that you may not sleep too well or that you're going to have the, these feelings persisting for some time yet. 
support, which is a, mainly of three kinds. There's the explanations and reassurance. Explain to someone in language which they will understand the physiology of fear, why you're having these symptoms. The fact that your heart beats more rapidly when you're afraid is a sign of it being a normal heart, not a sign of it being an abnormal heart. In other words, normalizing the situation. Uh, the non-verbal reassurance which a mother gives to a frightened child, which you have to gauge it to this particular person. What is it that will comfort them? A touch, a cuddle if that's appropriate. Um, we don't always get it right. I remember one anxious looking patient at St Christopher's Hospice and I sat on her bed and held her hand and she immediately got out the other side of the bed. <laughs> I'd intruded on her, her safe space. So we had to gauge it. We reach out and we see how the person responds and very often they'll, in a sense, cling back and before very long, you know, it's safe to get close to this person. Um, I was taught as a psychiatrist never to get close to patients. Absolute rubbish. In situations like this, closeness is one of the things that people find most comforting and most helpful. They don't mistake it for a sexual advantage. Um, don't forget the family. Family are the main source of support for most of us most of the time. And uh, they're the ones who need to be drawn in and involved, um, provided they're not even more panic-stricken than the patient. <laughs> I've been fascinated working, for instance, with cancer patients at home, how often you get a situation where the patient is terrified lying in bed, and that's terrified the family, who sort of come on tiptoe and convey their anxiety to the patient. And it, again, you get a sort of infectious uh, fear within the family, which may feed on itself. But by the same token, if you can tr reassure the family, you're going to be helping the patient too. So re recognize the, the group influence, whether we're talking about family or other patients in the same ward or whatever. Medication has its place. Um, the big problem with all of these medications, of course, is that they work, which may make people too reliant on them. Uh, you find you sleep better with the sedative and therefore you take them every night and before very long you, you've got hooked, etc, etc. I'm sure with this audience I don't need to dwell on those dangers. But as single doses in crisis situations they can be very valuable. And relaxation exercises which not only deal with some of the symptoms but also empower the patient. Because people in these situations uh, when they're feeling highly stressed also feel very helpless and anything you can teach them which they can do to relieve their own stress empowers them and leaves them feeling less helpless. And it doesn't much matter, there are so many different forms of relaxation, whether you're talking about aromatherapy, which is wonderful, or all my cancer patients love aromatherapy, or massage, or just relaxation exercises. You really need to choose the right thing for the right patient. I mean, you know, there are some men who wouldn't dream of doing aromatherapy. It's, it's girly stuff. Mm -hmm.